So uh, for our second community spotlight, I uh, asked Elaine to join us. And uh, I'll, I'll let Elaine introduce herself a little bit. We uh, like became acquainted over the years through like some of her work in development and GoCo Colorado and those kinds of things. Um, what's your like self bio? Sure. Autobiography, I guess it's yeah, called. Yeah, I am so excited to be here. I don't get to talk to developers very much anymore. Um, I even wore my developer con converse uh, with my fancy dress just for this event. <laughs> um, so my name is Elaine Marino. I uh, transitioned careers from advertising to become a Ruby and Ruby on Rails developer seven years ago. It was when Jeff was still at Jumpstart Labs in DC. Galvanize didn't exist. And I was in one of the very first classes here in Colorado. And I um, got an internship, and I was basically doing software development full time for two years, and um, experienced all the barriers to entry that are really now in the news. And from that, I actually ended up starting my own business. And my own business ended up being um, in, the, in the tech event space, kind of by accident. I was doing women in tech events. I did lady coders out of Boulder, Colorado, and from there got a contract with the state of Colorado to put on Go Code Colorado, and I did that for four years. And now, um, I feel like the industry has finally caught up with everything that I experienced, and I launched a diversity and inclusion consulting company called Equally, and I do trainings and workshops uh, based off of all my experiences and a whole lot of research. So that's what I'm here today to talk about. People use research for stuff. I just do, <laughs> like, I usually just make stuff up. Um, I wanted to ask a couple questions, yeah, and kind of like bringing it home to Colorado as like mm -hmm. most folks are, are here in the local tech industry. Um, you, through like all these various initiatives, have gotten to kind of like see and touch like a lot of different communities and even communities around the state outside of Denver mm -hmm. and Boulder where like so much of our attention happens. Like what kinds of trends are you seeing uh, especially across the state, like as the tech industry is like growing? Yeah, um, well new communities are popping up, which is phenomenal. So like with, which, which ones are on your radar? I was gonna say for Go Code Colorado, I got to go all around the state, which was pretty fantastic. Grand Junction uh, has a really fantastic community. Uh, they have an amazing co-working space called Factory. Same thing with Montrose, they have proximity space. Those guys, Brian, Josh, um, Dennis, are all Where is Montrose, Colorado? <laughs> it is, it's like a, an hour and a half south-ish of Grand Junction on the other side of Gunnison, the other side of those mountains. Um, pretty fantastic, actually. You want to be a big fish in a small pond, go to Montrose, go to Grand Junction. Uh, they um, are doing really fantastic work. Durango um, is a very good kept secret. Um, best mountain biking in the world, right? And they have something called Vantif, which used to be Mercury Payments, which is the largest payment processing uh, company in the world. Uh, they have a huge headquarters there. They staff thousands of software developers. I know, it's this like little quiet secret. And then Solar City is there as well, Elon Musk's. Um, and their developer group for doing payments is also out of Durango. So there's some really cool stuff going on in other parts of the state. Coming here at the tail end of like Denver Startup Week, I think there's always been a, a bit of a push to say like, oh, Colorado's like the next Silicon Valley, the next, and then there's, uh, I'm always left with the question of like, do, do, mm, do you wanna have a Silicon Valley too? <laughs> like, there are lots of things I not prefer about Silicon Valley. Like, what do you see about the growth of Denver, Boulder tech and, and statewide tech, like with regards to kind of forging its own character versus yeah. other places? So, the best parts of Colorado will be that we intend, usually tend to be a little kinder, nicer to each other. Um, I lived on both coasts. I grew up in Los Angeles. I lived in New York City for seven years. Um, people in Colorado are just kinder and nicer in general. And I would really hope to see that spirit continue on. And so as Silicon Valley really does 
get here, and it really has, and the VC money flows. I actually heard the best thing yesterday. This one venture capitalist said, we destroy more companies than we build, <laughs> meaning that when that influx of cash comes into those companies, it pushes them to grow faster than they maybe were built to grow, right? And as developers, you really see that. Like, all of a sudden, this cash lands, and you've got to exponentially grow that product, and it sometimes breaks it, right? It wasn't fundamentally meant to be that big. Um, that kind of exponential growth is what causes a lot of the really bad parts of Silicon Valley, right? All the money flows in and all the bad behavior does as well. And so I think what is really our task in Colorado is to stay true to our roots, the work-life balance, the being kind to one another, and um, the true pioneering entrepreneurial spirit. Do you think... Um it, it, do you think it's like a negative on people's career if they're in a, for better or worse, Colorado is and will probably always be kind of a secondary market in tech? Like, is being here, am I giving up a lot, do you think, like in terms of salary, prestige, et cetera? Or is it possible to like just be here and be happy for a career? I guess it depends what you want. Um, I will say Sil Silicon Valley does have advantages. It's an older ecosystem, right? And so the things that are smaller here are just bigger there. And you can get a lot more done faster. There is more cash. There are more entrepreneurs. There is more access to larger companies. Um, but I... It really just depends what you want. And I think, no, I think you can be successful here. And it depends on your definition of success. I heard the definition of success once that I follow, which is you get to live anywhere you want. If you get to decide where you live, then you have made your life successful. And so that, to me, means you don't have to be in Silicon Valley, but you're still doing what you love. It's an interesting... Um... I feel like we have to remind ourselves if you spend a lot of time amongst tech people and so forth, it's easy to forget this like extreme level of privilege, which is like, I can quit my job and then like move literally <laughs> anywhere I want in the entire world and have a job like, mm, let's pessimistically say like two weeks from now, unless, <laughs> as long as they don't like check references and stuff. Um, don't call anyone I know. With... Uh, I know you're not like organizing GoCode this year, but wanted to bring it up a little bit. Can yeah. you, for folks who are not familiar, can you like give the pitch on GoCode? Sure, absolutely. It is a business app challenge started by the state of Colorado. It's the first and only of its kind at the state level. So the state opens its data for developers and entrepreneurs to get in there and to build apps that then um, they go on kind of a journey. So most of you probably participated in a hackathon and at the end of that weekend, you're um, idea in your app usually dies, right? There's no one to really carry the forward momentum on. And so GoCode Colorado was created to try and carry on that forward momentum. So it's a all weekend hackathon in five locations around the state. So that includes Durango and Grand Junction, Colorado Springs, Fort Collins and Denver. Usually takes place in April. And then from that two finalists from each location so that's ten total go on to a mentor weekend. And that mentor weekend is meant to mentor the applicant along. And then from there, it goes on for another month um, to a finals round, and then the top three teams win $25,000 each to either carry on their app or just to um, have some money for what they built. Yeah, it's uh, some pretty neat things have like come out of it and a lot of use of public data and like all, mm -hmm. that, all that kind of stuff. Um, time back to equally work. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I, I'm a believer in the theory that uh, like racism is generally a white people's problem, sexism is generally a men's problem. Uh, if I'm a man in software development and I'm aware of these issues and trying to create like a more positive, inclusive culture, uh, what are some of the things that I might like subconsciously do to erode that kind of culture that aren't like the, the obvious, you know? The, the most uh, obvious? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in general, uh, tech has two problems. They have a pipeline problem, but they also have a leaky faucet problem. And I actually think the pipeline problem is less an issue than it is um, minorities and, and women in particular and minorities leaving after a little while. And they leave because they're always the odd duck. Right? So you can be the odd duck 
for a first year. You can be the odd duck for the first five years. But after 10 years, you're like, oh my God, why am I still the only? Why am I always the only? And so the, the things that can happen is, is that if you are in an engineering team and you have just one female, you got to hire another female, somebody else of a minority background. Um, and and you have to get to try at least three or four, frankly. It's kind so of like a critical mass. A critical almost. mass, yeah. And a critical mass is still very small. Like once you have three or four, you know, then they start hiring their friends. Because what tends to happen is that it's not that we're all racist and sexist. It's just that we like and know people who look and like ourselves. And so when you go to hire, you hire within your network. And your network are people that look like you. I am just as guilty. You go on my about page. All of them are ladies. I'm like, ooh, I need to hire a white dude. Um, and it's, it's true. Because, I know a couple. <laughs> you know a couple? <laughs> I'm well, well connected with those people. No, because you hire who you know. You know, everyone that comes up to me that wants to help me, they're female. It's great. Um, so, I have the, so I get it, right? It's very quickly, it's a slippery slope. So you need to be very careful when you have the only woman in your office because she will leave or the only minority in your office, he will leave. Um, the other things that are just small, uh, the culture tends to, the culture of the companies tend to fit um, who the majority are. And I actually said this yesterday at a Techstars talk, and one of the Techstar guys was like, oh my God, you described us. So what I basically said is, is if your office has ping pong and beer and scooters and flip flops um, and pizza on demand um, and foosball and foosball tournaments, and I can go on and on, right? It's fine, but you're only catering to a certain audience, right? And if you want to hire women who are, let's say, 35 years old, you need to aspire in your culture to think about, well, what would a 35-year-old woman care about? And then include those things as well. So don't overcorrect. Don't get rid of ping pong and foosball and scooters and all of those things. You're just saying we're not allowed to have fun. <laughs> I'm not at all. Keep all those things, but then add in a maternity leave policy, a child care policy, a sick children policy, <laughs> um, holistic healing. Like, what would she care about, right? So don't overcorrect and get rid of all the things that the gentlemen love, because that's actually what causes the... Um, the the defensiveness, right? Like you got to keep everything, but then also include everything else. Because, and even if you have no women on staff, if you build it, they will come. They will see, they'll be like, oh, they already have maternity care. I can't tell you how many companies don't have maternity care. And then one day a girl on staff gets pregnant and then they're like, oh shit, that's really expensive to course correct. Or I mean, in the like nightmare scenario, right, is that People have said things like, yeah, we're nervous about hiring women because we don't, we can't afford to have afford maternity it. leave. And it's mm -hmm. like, well, that's actually illegal. Um, <laughs> not only that, but... Not think, only are you a dick, sir, <laughs> but you're also a criminal. But that's also illegal. No, but just think about it, too. It's like, it's hard to also fathom at this point, you know, I... The problem isn't just gender and race. Like, that's what we go to first, but let me just paint a clearer picture. Tech runs very young, right? The average age for a software developer is 29. The mean is 27, which means that if you're a 40-year-old man, you're aging out very quickly from your own industry. And that sucks too, right? Um, and... <laughs> there are a couple of faces that are like, like shit. shit. <laughs> I'm right behind you, I'm right behind you. Work from home and don't tell them how long you've been in the industry. Um, no, it's, but the same thing, and classism and religion and the LGBTQ community and veterans and the disabled, like the list goes on and on and on. And tech tends to fail kind of across the board. And so in Colorado, we think, well, we don't have a very diverse racial population, but there are other ways to fix this issue. Um, and we just have to be a little bit more open-minded about it. The other blind spot, sorry, I'll just say really quickly, is Slack. Um, you got to be nice to each other on Slack, and you can't be so juvenile. It's, um, I know, <laughs> I'm sorry, um, but all of those, like, sexual harassment trainings you got in, like, in person, like, this crowd actually wouldn't do them in person. I used to work in advertising. They would totally do it in person. They don't do those things in person here. But, man, Twitter, Slack. Um, and our lives now are so public and private, right? Our work life 
is both. That, you know, don't be a dick on Slack, I mean, not Slack, don't be a dick on Twitter just because you're not at work, right? Your coworkers see that. They can follow you. Your managers can follow you. Be a good, kind person most of the time. And if you wouldn't say it to your mother, don't say it on Slack. That would be my piece of advice. Boom. That's your <laughs> mic dropper. Thanks very much, Elaine. You're welcome. Thank you, guys.